Hey everybody and welcome. Welcome to this Overlord podcast from the Great Library of Nazareth, focused on the new Season 3 episodes. In particular, we'll be discussing episode number one. I'm Corp Shepard, but call me Shep. And I'm the resident light novel expert. And with me... Hi, I'm Demiurge's humble servant, but you can call me Meep Meep as well. I'm the enemy only, the trash of the trash, as some people might say. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, let's not expand on this topic. Beware of spoilers, and uh, please note that it's our respective opinions what we are going to talk about, so you are free to not agree and have a different opinion, of course. I'll also be asking questions about the light novel for further clarification, because, um, yeah, the anime was really good, but not everything is clear. Mm -hmm. There's always differences between the two. You always miss a little bit of the context of the, the world and whatnot. But moving on, sure. you know, what brought you to the Overlord anime in the first place? Yeah, it's a funny story, Shep. Um, I accidentally stumbled upon it on YouTube. So it's a sped up version with a terrible <laughs> dub. Really? Wow. And yeah, I'm a really a picky anime watcher who likes to um, watch rather dark and depressing stuff. So mm. Overlord caught my immediate attention. Yeah, I can see. It doesn't only have this dark and depressing, but also this funny and embarrassing moments. So um, later it, of course, became... As my sole reason to watch Overlord became Demiurge-sama. But yeah, why did you pick up Overlord? Wow, yeah. Uh, I am actually still, a, I mean, in terms of the length of this community, a pretty new follower of Overlord. I picked it up mm -hmm. right as season two was starting. And literally, I was just <laughs> browsing Crunchyroll and I saw their little advertisements like, everybody wants to rule the world, right? And I was like, you know, I actually did want to rule the world as a kid, a lot. <laughs> I was like, ah, if I was in charge, the world would be a much better place, kind of thing. And I was like, yeah, yeah, it yeah, was like just course. enough for me, like, also, that lich guy looks really cool. I guess I'm gonna look mm -hmm. into this. And so I just, like, saw the art of Ein Sama, and I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. And I did. And it took a little while for me to get into it, um, but, like, by the time I got to the end of season two, and I was still only anime at this point, I was just like, I gotta, I was having, like, sweats after each episode. It's like, I gotta know what happens next. I'm in suspense. <laughs> I can't, I gotta, I gotta see the next thing. So uh -huh. that was basically me. And just after that, I was like, I held back on the light novels. And then I finished season two and I was like, it's going to be years until season three. I better just start reading the light novel. And then like two days later, they announce, hey, season three is coming out in like two months. And I was like, holy shit. So uh, I kind of got into the novels real fast because of that. But I really like the light novels and have not regretted that at all. So even though and we are now blessed by season three, I'm pretty happy with uh, how things have gone. So yeah, Studio Madhouse pulled uh, jokes on you on us there. Yeah. That was, uh, I feel like Moriyama was pulling it, the writer of Overlord, because, like, he ha you have to schedule these things pretty far in advance, but they just, like, we'll just surprise him. We'll hit him with a little cheap shot, but, yeah. Yeah. Well, everyone was happy about it, so thank you, Madhouse. Fingers crossed for season four. That's going to probably take way longer. <laughs> <laughs> right. But everyone is waiting for it. Mm-hmm. But, so, um, yeah, we're not we... at season four, we're at season three, so. <laughs> right. Um, so it's like a week ago when the opening of season three was officially um, presented to us. And what do you think about it? So when you first saw it? Yeah, I... It was, I mean, honestly, it was still stuck in my head all yesterday. I was listening to it a little bit to prepare for this podcast, and I listened to it, and I was like, oh god, it's stuck in my head all again, all day. The first <laughs> day I saw it, I got stuck in my head as well. I really like the Overlord openings. It, they did switch around the two artists mm -hmm. doing it, right? Uh, this one is Miss yeah. Android doing the opening rather than the ending for uh, season three. But I really like it. I dig the music a lot. Um, 
I actually really dig the lyrics. I mean, they're mostly in Japanese, so it's kind of hard, yeah, but there's a sure. lot of English in there, too. And maybe it's just because I'm American and the lyrics are all about devouring everything in sight. <laughs> I don't know. It just speaks to me on a cultural level. I mean, seriously, these lyrics are like, can't stop, won't stop, don't stop feeding. So tasty. Oh, it's, they're so creepy, but they actually hit the tone of the show really well. So I actually really like that a lot. How, what, yeah. are, what are you thinking? What are your initial thoughts? Um, do you listen to Miss Androids often? No, I can't say that I have any, uh, any, um, like, outside of Overlord? Nah. Okay, because, um, they did the opening, the second opening for ReZero. I think you know that anime, maybe, from name? Yeah, a little bit, but I can't say I know that much. And, uh, for Saga of Tanya the Evil, I think, yeah, the opening song as well for it. So I um, I listen to them really often, and when I first saw the opening for Overlord season three, I was well hit by how well Miss Android just gave the message of their own style and of Overlord, but the opening itself, the the animation. Mm. It disappointed me. Yeah. So, it's it's not what I'm used to from season two, and season two is my absolute favorite opening. Ah. To you, what's the ideal anime opening? What do you like to see the most? Well, I like when it's not too flashy, because, um, well, it gets me dizzy when there's too much, and when there's too much light, and too much movement, and... Um, it doesn't have to be long because, well, you know, I'm interested in the content and so I skip um, openings. Yeah, me too, for the most part. Yeah. I think. We are heretics. Yeah, well, you know, you see it a couple times. Maybe if you were like really into it, it's like, yeah, it's overworked time. You watch the whole, uh, you know, opening. Yes. But if you're binge watching a little anime, you're gonna skip the opening most of the time, let's be honest. I think my favorite opening that I can think of right off the bat is uh, probably One Punch Man. I just mm -hmm. really admire, because like, for the most part, openings, they they kind of regurgitate some of their they're foreshadowing what's gonna happen in the season. But One Punch yeah. Man, they're bold. All that bullshit in that opening, none of that happens in the show. None <laughs> of it. It's just like random action scenes with Saitama. And so I don't yeah, I understand like most animes can't do that or shouldn't really. They're more I won't say that One Punch Man isn't character focused, but um it just isn't quite in the same way that like Overlord is very plot focused. And so like not putting in some plot details into the uh, opening would probably be a bit of a shame, but um, mm -hmm. Well, people yeah. still like the opening. What did you think of the lip scene? The intimate <laughs> lip scene? How did you feel about that one? You well, know what I'm whole... talking about? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. That's <laughs> when Albedo and Shaltir are like, um, caressing yeah. Ainz's bones. <laughs> it's super uh. creepy. <laughs> yes, it is creepy. It's like a little and... tantalizing. Don't get me wrong, but <laughs> it's mostly really unsettling. But I, I mean, that captures the like relationship that they have with Ainz pretty well. I actually really liked that. It sums up the darker side of their obsessive and unrequited love. It's, I... It gives me actual chills, so. Yeah. Um, so, do you know Kakegurui, maybe? This Kake... anime? No, I'm afraid not. No, okay. I'm kind of like, uh, no. a, I don't have a wide variety of knowledge with anime. I'm kind of a pleb in that regard. That's no problem. It's just, this lip scene reminded me very much of that anime because it's mostly loot and um oh i see yeah oh i still having <laughs> crippling depression <laughs> okay so um moving on to the episode itself all right yeah 
the very beginning scene where Eins is thanking all of his guardians for their good work. Mm -hmm. Right? You know this what I'm is, talking about? This uh, is, yeah. In the light novel, this is kind of like, this is just after season two, and this is kind of an awards ceremony where he is talking with all of his minions and being like, we've done a great job, a great job in the kingdom, so I'd like to award those people who are who did the best work, and then... Although the anime doesn't quite get into this, he essentially is like, yeah, unfortunately, sorry, Antoma, it's true that you got beat down by Blue Rose, but uh, I'm going to give you like a consolation prize. And he's like, ah, this is kind of like a purple heart, right? So it's that scene there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, I still have two questions about that scene. So, who are all those creatures behind Aura and Mare and Sabas and Solution and so on? Yeah. Like, there's a wolf and yeah. a chameleon. The So, we actually... The anime does have the chameleon and the wolf. I think the wolf is called Finn, which is probably short for Fenrir, you know, popular wolf mm -hmm. name. Uh, those are all of Aura's pets, or at least some of those monsters were Aura's pets, right? The wolf and the chameleon... Are, I think the chameleon is quatricile or quatricile, something like that. Um, so this is like a big ceremony, and all the the biggest mm -hmm. minions from like oh, it was like normally the ceremonies are a little like easygoing. I would I mean nothing in Nazareth <laughs> is easygoing, Nazarick. but um, in this case because it was like an uh, honorary ceremony, they brought out all of their most high level vassals from each of the. Uh, each of the guardians. So mm -hmm. Demiurge has his evil lords, the evil lords of wrath and jealousy and lust. And then yes. <laughs> uh, Aura brought out her her most fancy magical beasts. And I'm we didn't. It's never really expounded upon. I think uh, Mari has some dragons. So I bet there was a dragon back there. Um, and so it's just basically the yeah, best the of the best. Yeah, the throne room is not big enough for that. Yeah. <laughs> well, throne room's pretty big. I bet you could fit a dragon in there, but I'm not sure. Uh, so it, it very much is just like the best of the best for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Antima wanted to fight Evil Eye to get revenge, right? For her That's true. pretty bad defeat. She wants to steal her but... voice specifically to replace the voice that evil eye burnt out of her with her vermin bane. Yeah. Right. Vermin bane is the main problem. I mean, how does Antima think she can, like, go past vermin bane to defeat evil eye? Yeah, that's, uh, it's still a little bit of a matter of debate whether or not Antoma would beat evil eye in a straight 1v1. Um, in the light novel it's pretty explicit and it says, like, well, it's not very explicit, actually. That's the problem. It, it, the, the light novel literally poses the question to Evil Eye in like a very out of character tone. It's like, if I, uh, if you asked Evil Eye why she won, she would say teamwork, of course, and like she points at it like, oh, because I have my allies here supporting me and and giving me breathing room to cast my spells and do all my stuff. Like they were able to just buy me enough time to win. It does yeah. sound like that um and Thomas just like too fast and she has enough tricks up her sleeve that she would probably win in a straight 1v1 but it's kind of hard to say you know i mean maybe she could make a countermeasure to deal with vermin bane like a i mean there's got to be ways to sort of insulate yourself from like air attacks if you're ready for it but mm -hmm. i don't know that i always liked Antoma just cuz like the talisman answer talisman mancer um, she, like, has all these, like, cool, like, scra uh, like paper seals that she throws out, and she can create all these spells with them. Maybe there's yeah. a spell she could use to protect herself, but it's not really clear, so... Well, she didn't use it in her fight versus Evil Eye the first time, so maybe she thinks that the other Pleiades will help her or anything. We'll see. Yeah, I'm not sure. Revenge is a, a dish best served cold. <laughs> maybe she'll want to... I'm not sure if she'll want a, f a fair fight. I'm not sure. Yeah, and Toma seems pretty vengeful, but I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so let's maybe move on. Mm -hmm. um, so this is basically the free day of the Guardians. 
And what you first see is Aura, Shaltier and Albedo going out. And um, Albedo tries to ride her bicorn, her, um, her own pet. Well, I think and... we did miss the maid scene. There's a couple scenes before that with uh, the maids in the cafeteria. You want to talk about those, or...? I don't think that there's anything unclear, unless you want to mention anything. Uh, I'll just mention quickly, I was a little disappointed in those scenes. Um, they just didn't... In the light novel, they serve a bit more of a purpose, but in this, it was uh -huh. just kind of like maids being cute. And that's fine. I got nothing against cute maids. But um, <laughs> yeah. it was so, it was a trimmed out, like a lot of the conversation between the maids. So I thought that was uh -huh. a bit of a shame because there is, there's like a bit of foreshadowing there. But um, regardless, let's, yeah, let's go to the bicorn scene. Okay. So I had the question, like, this bicorn, it's Alberto's pet. How could she not know that she couldn't ride it? Because she's a virgin and she can only like um, use her full powers when she's finally deflowered. Mm -hmm. How could yeah. this happen? That's uh, a good question. I feel like a recurring theme with Al Alberto is that um, she's trapped in the throne room so much that she just like, and that's all she did as an NPC too. So she was kind of like made and then like left there as sort of like window dressing. That she just hasn't really gotten to do a lot. And she doesn't really even... Like, she has some, like, programmed-in battle experience. But beyond that, she's actually really inexperienced. Um, she's very yeah. smart, but she doesn't have a lot of experience. I mean, all of the Guardians are that way, right? That's that's how Shaltir got so ensnared, is that she overestimated herself. Which is not mm -hmm. too unreasonable, but... Um, I guess I would probably crop, uh, put it down to something like that. Okay. So, um, Shaltier also mentions a person named, or maybe not a person, I don't know, um, Kyu Kyuhuku or something? Kyoko. And or, yeah, okay. Kyoko. Yeah, that's a good uh, point. I have no idea how to that? pronounce that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, yes, that's true. Um, let's consider that a bit of foreshadowing for a character okay. that we'll see later. The, the weird thing about this, about this entire season so far, uh, is that we're starting with Volume 8. This is like uh, the entire, like, you know, a, a day in the life of a, a Nazarick maid, and what's Ayn's up to, and how is he becoming a leader? This is all things that Volume 8 sort of is, uh, establishes, and that's what it's all about. But um, Season 2 ended with Volume 6. So Volume 7 is actually came out first and we're kind of breaking the continuity of the light novels but not the chronological continuity of overlord volume eight does happen before volume seven but it was not written before obviously so if you had, well, if you read the novels you actually already know who kyoko is because he uh -huh. shows up in there. But um, that hasn't quite happened yet. So in this case, a lot of this stuff is actually sort of reoriented. So that like all this Volume 8 stuff where, you know, it's like, oh, we discovered this character in Volume 7. Let's flesh them out a little in Volume 8. Is instead, mm -hmm. Volume 8 is now foreshadowing things that will happen later on. So, so it's, it's kind of an anime thing. Yeah, yeah, it's more or less just kind of like an anime thing. But um, is it the same situation with Pulcinella? Because he wasn't mentioned at all in No, uh, actually, this seasons? is the first scene we ever see him. Uh, the scene ah. here is uh, Moray uh, jumping down and greeting this strange, beaked, white-robed man in the Colosseum's entrance. Yeah. But um, who is he? I mean, he says that he's working for Demiurge and helping him with his breeding experiments. Yes, yes. Um, but... It's kind of mysterious, you know. <laughs> right. There's not a lot written about this guy. Uh, this is basically it. There's a, maybe a little bit here and there elsewise, but uh, he's like a weird clown person. He doesn't actually get that much characterization in the anime, but there's really not that much in general. 
Um, okay. He has a way of, in the uh, light novel, he's way more about like, I just want to bring a smile to everyone's faces. And Moray, the only thing I could ask from you is a smile as well. He's really creepy. Um, <laughs> and well, yeah, everyone in Nazarick is somewhat strange. Yeah. Well, you know, they're very eccentric. Um, yeah. And I, I feel like you don't get quite his personality here. He he looks on the bright side of everything. So, like, yeah. It's obvious that Demir just basically conducting horrible, horrible experiments. But he's like, oh, but it's for the, the sake of love. And he actually, in the light novel, talks a lot about life on the happy farms and how things are so wonderful there. And Demir just kindness truly touched the heart of every sheep that he has That's under his true. care. So the it's uh, is always working on the happy farm. What do you mean, Shep? I know, I know. It's, and he's always working life. for the betterment of everyone. Yes, I I know. Um so it's uh he's a weird guy. I don't know what else to say about <laughs> Pulsinella. Okay, that's that's totally fine. So um can we move on to to Alberate? Like the scene oh, is yes. called the, it's inside joke. Yeah, the the big crowning scene of this episode, really. So, uh, we always knew that Alberto was a bit, um, a bit crazy after Eins, to say it in the mm -hmm. language of Nazarick people. And uh, so, how did you like it when <laughs> Alberto just straight jumps onto Eins and starts raping him? Yeah. Um. You know, <laughs> I don't know what to say. Uh, it's well, it's typically it's really Overlord. Yeah, it is very typical Overlord. This is uh, this scene is it's intense and it's crazy and <laughs> yeah. that gleam in her eyes is it's more of a, a predator looking down prey than a love. But I don't want to kink shame, so. Um, <laughs> Yeah, the the scene I think it actually is really well captured in the anime, and there are like a couple things that are missing. Like at the very end, Ainz actually orders Albedo into confinement, essentially jails her for a, a few days to cool her head off, and um, we don't actually get a lot of the con. It's just kind of like ah, funny thing happened where somebody tried to rape Ainz. <laughs> right? A day in the life. <laughs> well, uh, the animation was really good. It was good, yeah. Um, and there's even a funny <laughs> thing in the... I wish they had fit this into the anime, but she's like, tries to tear her dress off, and then she's like, stupid magical clothing? It doesn't rip! Ah! <laughs> so, um, but uh, they just like... I was... How did you... So as a... Here's something that I thought was interesting. Did you have trouble parsing that scene? Because there are... There's so many people yelling and talking... At the same time, the subtitles are like stacking up, like three lines tall. Like, would you were you able to understand? Like, obviously, it's kind of clear what the general gist of things, but like, what the Eight Edge Assassins were saying, and what Alberta was saying, and what Mare was saying. I feel like that's kind of the disadvantage of like subtitles when you have so much chaos happening on screen. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the problem will be even worse in dub version. Uh -huh. But I saw the raw version first. So without without any meaning, I just looked at the animation. I couldn't wait for the stuff. Ah, okay. And so you were already um, a little prepared for that chaos. As I well. was prepared. Okay. Yes, I knew what was going to happen, and I was just focusing on the aspect of a jump scare. You know, yeah, like um, yeah. in horror games when she suddenly <laughs> jumps on you, and you are like, "What? What? I'm dead! Oh my god!" Yeah, some of those screenshots and... of her glowing yellow eyes are are pretty intense. <laughs> yes. But uh, the whole scene is very interesting. The only question that stays is um, how... Uh, I mean, she's like getting empowered because there's this um, violet aura yeah, around her. Yeah, purple aura. I but, don't um, know what that's about, really. I don't know if that's her activating like a skill. like a. I mean, she's got a mount. Maybe she's got some mounting skills, you know? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but um, it was about the power level as well, because the eight edge assassins who are actually there to save Ainz when he's in trouble, they couldn't yeah, save him nah. from Albedo. 
They are... They were chosen more for stealth and their reconnaissance abilities than their strength. Because, like, they're, they're see-through uh, in the anime because they're invisible. They're, like, they have a permanent invisibility effect on them. So they're kind of just, like, sh eyes in the shadows constantly looking for danger. Uh, but in terms of, like, mm -hmm. power level, it's kind of theorized that they're, like probably not that much higher than like level 50 at best so they're kind of chump okay. change so they just like play out as but um yeah but like weird robotic spider things basically the same <laughs> right basically the same okay then let's move to my most disappointing scene mm. the buffing scene yes the bath <laughs> um this so... is actually from a just a chronological standpoint this scene happens at, it's basically the the scene that ends volume eight uh and i thought mm -hmm. it was interesting that they kind of injected it right here at the well i mean it's at after the credits of the first episode so in a way it's kind of at the end of at least the episode yeah. but uh well i don't you should air your grievances <laughs> so um the episode mostly focuses on Eins, and I think that it did a great job in showing how loot a skeleton can be. That's <laughs> true. Because yes. his magnificence, and it's actually just bones. But yes, there's beautiful ivory. Yes, it's quite enrapturing, <laughs> the really. Suck it in. <laughs> but um, you know, the most disappointing thing was Demiurge in this scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's too lithe. He's just... Where's the muscle? Where's the ripped... Right! Like, where's the ripped Demi Urge muscle? I, uh, it is a shame. I have seen so much fan art. There was so... He was so swollen and so sexy. Yeah. And this was a muscle debuff. I was crying. Yeah, it feels like they just kind of slapped him together like... Eh, just draw a guy and then put Demiurge's head on him. Oh, don't worry even about the <laughs> tail, you know, whatever. Yes! There's that no was the most disappointing as well. Mm. But, but, I was persuaded that though uh, we didn't see his true appearance, like, yeah, um, he would have stolen Eins the show, and we yeah. must, under no circumstances, steal Eins' show, so um, I think that's okay. That's why I'm pretty happy with the episode in general. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I must say that I have a weakness for man and towel. Oh, okay. But <laughs> <laughs> we, we saw a little bit, you know. Um, there was plenty of that, just, yeah. Just a frame, a little second, but it was enough. <laughs> I, I praise, praise Studio Madhouse, thank you. Yes. Um... I just missed the tail. <laughs> Yeah, for the opposite sex, it's um. I actually thought what they did with the female guardians was pretty pretty classy. There is no scene, there's no written scene of them barging in in the light novel and saving the female guardians and getting a little like wow <laughs> view with them. But um, yeah, there is a little so bin art. The person who does art for uh for Overlord, the Overlord novels yeah. at least. Of those guardians, those female guardians taking a bath, kind of post golem attack. So that's out there, but they decided not to put it in. I thought that was a pretty classy move. So I was pretty. I, well, well, I won't say I was satisfied, but I thought it was <laughs> nice. I thought it was nice. So. Well, you would have liked to see the females, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's what I. Well, I mean. I would, <laughs> you know? Got you. So, yeah. No, I thought it was good. I thought it was good. I. I would have liked to see Demiurge. Demiurge and like Kokutus are kind of like watching, washing each other's uh, backs. Uh, some yes. some like little guardian to guardian bonding there wouldn't have been bad, but oh well. So yeah, I thought it, it was, was good. fine. Yeah, it was fine the way it was. Mm -hmm. Just just little disappointment because of the muscles, but in general it was fine. So we're uh, getting close to the end of our timer here. How did you feel about the episode in general? Would you rate it uh, anyway? Hmm, so from 10 points, I would give this episode an 8. Because mm -hmm. I want to keep um, the future episodes in check, so some episode can be better and some can be worse than that. 
a huge plus for the tail movement. Finally, That's Studio true. Madhouse had enough <laughs> points uh, budget so to give him, as a demiurge, my master, uh, mm -hmm. the tail movement that he deserves. Yeah, I, uh, what it is adorable. <laughs> he's like gets a little memo from Ainz, and he's like wagging his tail like a puppy, just a little bit. Yes. He's like trying to keep it under control. He's like, I can't show everything, but oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. Yeah, what was uh, your rating? Hmm. So I eat this kind of episode up. I love my favorite thing in Overlord is Ainz being the kind of like uh, I must become the great ruler of Nazarick. I've gotta, I've gotta keep improving myself and find the way through, and I'll I'll become a good leader sooner or later if I try hard enough. So I just love that kind of stuff. <laughs> I love this this arc of him and him bumbling through and finding a way to be inspiring so yeah. uh i would put this maybe like nine out of ten maybe even ten out of ten there's oh, i had a, a few just dis like problems with just like ah why is there no so i'm a bit of a Mare fan and there are a lot of uh -huh. skip scenes here that we're never gonna see of Mare going to like the library and going out and visiting the Lizardmen village that would have been great to see. There's a lot of... This is a lot of Volume 8 that this vol uh, this episode covers. That, you know, and uh, the three scenes with Mari just get skipped. And I mm. think that's a bit of shame. But I understand why. They're not the most plot-critical scenes. They're mostly character-building for Mare and showing off some parts of the world we haven't seen in a while, like the Lizardmen village and the library that we've this very well, show is kind of named after as well as like oh what's it like on the frozen floor of uh where Kokutus reigns what's that look like so it would have been nice to see kind of some of those things but ah, we don't have I get time it. for that i get why they <laughs> skipped it you know so yeah well okay then let's end this episode here right yeah it was great talking to you it was great talking to people out there so thank you very much for tuning in to the Overlord Podcast, brought to you by the Great Library of Nazarick. And this is signing off, Shepard. Right, and make sure to visit our Overlord Discord server. Maybe we can see each other there and talk to each other, and I will share my newest Demiurge art with you if you ask nicely. There's no signing limit to it. Signing out as well. 